This is WEFT Champaign, 90.1 FM, community radio for East Central Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Weekend Heartbeat, a series of shows that represent a collective effort to bring the thoughts and actions of people working in the nonprofit arena to the forefront where it needs to be. Join us each Saturday at this time to enjoy a different episode in this series. Upcoming shows will include Joy George, the first Saturday of each month, hosting Peace Talks Radio, which talks about the personal conflicts we face every day in ways we may effectively deal with these challenges. Also in this series is Doug Olive, the third Saturday of each month, who will be hosting Speaking of Democracy, which takes a look at political theory and its sociology. Another in this series is Pause Radio on the fourth Saturday of each month, which is an informative program on the care and well-being of our companion animals. Today's show, A New Lamp, features Marilyn Rickey and Sean David, who will be bringing an informative light to the Baha'i faith and its philosophy. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of WEFT, its board of directors, associates, station manager, or Prairie Air Incorporated. The following program was pre-recorded and consists of two parts. The first part was recorded in 2011. The second part was recorded on March 8, 2015. Welcome to Weekend Heartbeat. I'm Sean David, and this is A New Lamp. New Lamp for Old. New Lamp for Old. Remember how Aladdin headed out to get oil for his mother's old dented tarnished lamp? And in the market, he met a magician calling out these words. This strange man was offering to give him a brand new shiny lamp for his old one. That's what I want to offer you, if you'll have it. A new lamp of spiritual guidance. But maybe you already have such a lamp, which still burns brightly. Great. You are still welcome to join us simply to learn who we are. But maybe your lamp of divine guidance has gotten dented and tarnished like Aladdin's. Or perhaps you have no such lamp at all. To you, I offer a new lamp. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Welcome to A New Lamp, a program designed to make you acquainted with the Baha'i religious faith. I hope you will choose to spend the next few minutes with me. Thanks. One November morn Birds were singing in the hillside All through the dawn Snow-white clouds gaped open-eyed Dazzled by the light The nightingale of paradise Was poised to take his flight
smiles would open where he wandered fruit form on the flowers even the sun paled in his company where he rode his horse the everlasting prince of glory looked out on it all the Steps that rang out in Aka echoed round the world. The next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about Baha'u'llah, the one the Bab referred to as he whom God will make manifest. The child, Mirza Hussein Ali, was born on November 12, 1817, in Tehran, Persia, which is now Iran, to a noble family of ancient ancestry. His father had a high-ranking position in the government of the Persian king, the Shah. They lived the winter months in Tehran, but moved to their ancestral home in the mountains in the hot summer months. He was brought up in luxury, wearing silks and brocades. He did not attend school, but was taught at home. From an early age, he exhibited an innate knowledge and wisdom and was often sought out for counsel. I mentioned his ancestry. People who are interested in the prophecies of the major religions will find this important. I would refer you to a book by William Sears, a Thief in the Night, for more on prophecy. But here is a brief look at his lineage. He is descended from Abraham via his third wife, Keturah, from Zoroaster, the founder of that faith, from Jesse, the father of King David, through Salathiel, whose daughter married the Persian king Cyrus, via Sadan, via Yadajur to Baha'u'llah. You see, there is a reason for all those biblical begats boring as they may seem. He loved nature and spent much time out of doors. Much of his time was given to the care of the poor, and he became known as the father of the poor. At age 18, he married Asiya Kanum, whom he referred to as Nawab. She shared the trials of his life until her death. When the Bab began his mission, he sent a scroll to Hussein Ali that he had written. Hussein Ali was enthralled by it, and declared it must be of God. After this, he actively promoted the cause of the Bab. He was offered, after his father's death, the position his father had held in the government, but to everyone's amazement, he rejected it. During the Bab's confinement, 81 of his followers met under the hospitality of Hussein Ali for a conference at a garden at Badasht. Here they stayed for 22 days. It was at this time each was given a new name, and Hussein Ali was thereafter known as Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. After the Bab was executed, a few young Babis made a foolish attempt on the Shah's life. 
The plot failed, but created again severe persecution of the Bob's followers. Though innocent of complicity, Baha'u'llah and some of the others of the Bob's followers were thrown into a dungeon where he remained four months. This dungeon is called the Siakal, the Black Pit. It was here that Baha'u'llah came to understand that he himself was the promised one that the Bab referred to as he whom God will make manifest. Take us to the prisoner, let us gaze into his eyes to see what kind of man takes a nation to Take us to the prison, let us look upon his face to see why twenty thousand men would gladly take his place. Won't someone give a drink to him? Remove the chains and let him live. Let him live. to the prisoner let us listen to his voice to see why worlds of wisdoms in a cell without a choice take us to the prison torn and bent beneath the chains we wonder if the world is really worthy of his pain I sorrow not for the burden of my imprisonment, neither do I grieve over my abasement or the tribulations I suffer at the hands of mine enemies. By my life, they are my glory, wherewith God hath adorned his own self. Baha'u'llah. Thanks so much for being with me this morning. I hope you have found a blessing during these few minutes. If you want to learn more about the Baha'i religion, you can go online to www.bahai.us. To contact me, my email address is anewlamp at yahoo.com. Thanks, and have a great day.
Welcome again to our March program of A New Lamp. Our guest today is Michael Felty, Vice Chairman of the Local Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is in Champaign. In January, our guest was Amy, a.k.a. Mrs. Michael Felty. Hi, Michael. Good to have you join us today. It's great to be here. Hey, Michael. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm thinking that you grew up in this area. Am I correct about that? Tell me a little bit about yourself, about your family, your education, whatever you think would be interesting. Well, I was born in southern Illinois, in McLeansboro, Illinois, oh. in 1950. And my, my folks came to Champaign every summer to go to summer school at mm -hmm. the University of Illinois. So we were familiar <laughs> with the place. And finally, they moved here in 1958 and brought their three sons with them. So I've been uh -huh. here since 1958. And I went to Garden Hills grade school, and then I went to uni high school after that. I went to the University of Illinois in engineering, which was basically right across the street from <laughs> uni high. Right. And then when I, when I graduated, I went to work at, at Plato, which was basically on the engineering campus, and I worked there until 1991, so I spent from 1961 until 1991 in the same two-block radius. <laughs> 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 and it was, it was pretty good. There were some interesting things that happened along the way. Um, and then after that, um, I stopped working at Plato, and my wife, Amy, and I moved to South Carolina for a new adventure. We were there for about a year and a half. And then we mm -hmm. left there and moved to Taiwan also for about a year and a half, more like a year and three months. Then we moved back here, and I've been here ever since. So that's my history of this place. Uh -huh. my, uh, I graduated in mathematics. Now you're confusing me. You went to engineering school mm -hmm. here at U of I. That's right. But you graduated in mathematics. That's correct. I, okay. I Changed courses along was, the way? No. I was actually in two colleges at the same time mm. uh, when, I, when I started school. It mm -hmm. was a new program that the university had started called Five Year Plan. And what you do is after five years, you graduate with two degrees. Wow. Um, and so in one college, I was in electrical engineering, and in the other college, I was in mathematics, which is what I really liked the best. Uh -huh. But, but I'd, I'd done well on my exams, and so they thought that this was appropriate to put me in these two colleges. After three years, I wanted out of the engineering one. And so they reluctantly you... let me exit the program. Uh -huh. They didn't want their initial guinea pigs to <laughs> bolt. <you> know, <laughs> but they reluctantly let me out of the program. And so I went into mathematics, which is where I graduated. Yeah. And knowing that life being a mathematician might be difficult unless you're brilliant or you want to teach, I decided to study computer science along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's what my major work was, was mm -hmm. computer science. That's what I, I was a, um, a computer scientist at Plato, a programmer, some people call it a software architect, others call <laughs> it, uh, sometimes I called it a software composer. Oh, wow, <laughs> I like that. That goes along with a little <laughs> musical uh, <laughs> part of you, uh, uh, yeah, along yeah. with the mathematics. Yeah. Now you're retired, is that right? I am. All right. And what is your main interest mostly now that you're retired? What are you doing with yourself? Well, when I was very young, my earliest memory of life actually was hearing my grandmother play the piano. And I, uh -huh. I remember being under the piano and looking up. And she had a Steinway grand piano. And, oh. and I remember seeing her fingers dance along the keyboard as she was playing. <laughs> and I recall the music very well. It was a Scott Joplin ragtime piece, I think. But I've never found it. I don't mm. know which one it was. But it was, it was wonderful. 
She was a virtuoso pianist. So wow. She this place got Joplin. She must have been. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's a long story that, about her, if you want to hear it. I don't know if this is the right time. Oh, go ahead. Let's hear it. It tells a lot about the times that we live in and the times that she lived in and mm -hmm. how far we've progressed. She was born in 1887, and in 1903, I think it was, um, she actually went to a music conservatory. I have the name of it somewhere, but I don't remember it at the, at the moment. Um, but it was a good conservatory. This is very rare at the time sure. for a woman to go into, into music. You know, mm. Women were, you know, it, it just wasn't done. They just played the piano at home a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and some were teachers and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. She was very good. So they, they allowed her into this conservatory. And um, she was in a four-year program in applied piano. And, well, she was noted because there were not very many women in music. Right. Um, and so they arranged for her to have, after graduation, to have a three-city tour playing with orchestras, you know, just as a sort of a, an experiment to see if this would be acceptable to the world. Um, and so... They had all that arranged, but there was one last thing that had to happen before she could go on this tour. She had to graduate. Okay. Right. And in order to do the, gra uh, the graduation, she had to give a senior recital. And to prepare for the senior recital, she decided in her rather flamboyant way to bob her hair and dye it red. <laughs> 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 what year was this? This was like 1905, <laughs> and, you know, I, I, the, this was the age of the Gibson girl, right. you know, I mean, long dresses yes, and the and hair, the hair and long hair piled yeah. on top of her right. head, yes. very quaint, we think of it now, the Victorian and, yeah. and um, the Edwardian era. The Edwardian, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, um, and so to dye her hair and cut it short, they threw her out of school. Ouch. Oh. And they canceled the tour, of course. Ouch. I mean, just for that. You know, other than that, she showed great decorum, but, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't let her do that. So oh my. she um, went back to McLeansboro and got married and had nine children one of whom was my mother, mm -hmm. who was also a pianist, a very good one. And she played in the schools. She entertained the children in her first grade classes all the time. Yeah. So there was always a piano in her room at the school. Mm -hmm. right. And many people threw out Champaign, and some moved to Urbana, would come up to me as I wandered around the University of Illinois in my... Uh, school years and working years and, mm -hmm. and recognize me from pictures that she showed and remark about her piano playing and what oh. a wonderful teacher she was. Mm. That's nice. So yeah. I, got, I got my musical ability through this kind of lineage. Yeah, I was going to say, it, must, it really runs in your family. It does. It, it really has inspired me throughout my life. Mm -hmm. So I've been playing for about 54 years. Wow. So since I retired in 2002, I decided to concentrate on music. I've played in a number of bands, um, and mm -hmm. I like to play popular music and blues music and kind of jazzy music. Yeah. Um, wow. You're in a band now, aren't you? I am. I'm in two bands. Ooh, what are they called? Uh, one of them's the Prairie Dogs, and... And I've been playing with them for about a year. In the other band, I've, I've, uh, I, last night was our first performance. We're calling ourselves WJCM, which stands for, I think, We're John, Charlie, and Michael, myself being the Michael part. And we're a trio on guitar and voice and bass and piano and some harmonies. And that went well. Last Great. Night. So oh, good. 
So, um, this has been delightful hearing your music and hearing about your music. Uh, and, and we're hoping that just maybe we can hear a little bit of your music today. Well, I have two pieces prepared, and um, both of them are songs that derive from the Baha'i faith. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is called Blessed is the Spot. It's prayer set to music. I'm not going to sing. I'm not that good of a singer, but I do have a rendition on the piano. Um, and the other one is called The Queen of Carmel, and that's a composed song. It's not a prayer. She, so what are we referring to as the Queen of Carmel? Well, the first few lines of the song, The Queen of Carmel, give an answer to that, which is, Standing on a mountain top, looking across the bay, the Queen of Carmel reigneth, she reigns majestically. It's talking about the Shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel in Haifa, Israel. And it's a, it's a beautiful building, and you can see it far away. In, if you're traveling by sea in the Mediterranean, you can see it far away, and it's a beautiful presence. And she is a queen. Yes. All right. I'd love to hear that. Isn't that beautiful? That's nice. All right. Michael, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. So uh, we're also going to hear Blessed is the Spot? Yes, and since that's a prayer, I have the actual prayer that form the lyrics, and the prayer goes like this. Blessed is the spot and the house and the place and the city and the heart and the mountain and the refuge, and the cave, and the valley, and the land, and the sea, and the island, and the meadow, where mention of God hath been made, and his praise glorified.
Michael, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go back now uh, to the Baha'i faith. Have you been a Baha'i quite a while? How did you come to find the faith? I've been a Baha'i for 26 years. Okay. Um, and I actually heard about the faith back in high school. I didn't know it but I was in school with a daughter of a Hand of the Cause. Really? Zakrila Kadem. And I probably heard something about it then. I, I didn't spend that much time talking with May Kadem. Um, she was a wonderful Baha'i, is a wonderful Baha'i. And my wife, now, Amy learned some about the faith from May, um, and in years later, I, uh, of course, I've gotten to meet May a number of times for high school reunions and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We have some joy that we're both Baha'is. So that was the first opportunity I had to to know about the Baha'i faith. Yeah. My next opportunity was. I think in 1971, um, I was living with some other college students, and we liked all kinds of jazz music. And so I bought this recording of um, a person named Alice Coltrane, who was the wife of John Coltrane. Hmm. And I just loved this music. This recording was called Universal Consciousness. Mm. which gives you an idea of what mm. the topic was that, that the music was about. And on the inside, there were quotations from all kinds of faiths. And I remember that there were quotations from Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, and they were beautiful. I loved these quotations, but I had no idea who these people were. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the Internet yeah. <laughs> in 1971, so I, right. I, I didn't know who to ask. Mm -hmm. who, who are these people? But I loved those quotations. Something happened to my record albums sometime after that, and a lot of them were, were lost. There was a flood. Uh -oh. But I remember when I became a Baha'i 28 years later, I remembered those quotations. Wow. <laughs> I wanted that record album. And finally, about seven years ago, they re-released it on CD. Really? And there's a little booklet, and I opened it up in real tiny little print. <laughs> there are those quotations. <laughs> oh. So, so I, my memory is correct. Now, what was the name of that album again? Called Universal Consciousness. Huh. And it is... It is by, by Alice Coltrane. Alice it's jaw-breakingly gorgeous music. Wow. I'm going to check that out. Yeah. Uh, that's I've not heard of that one, and it sounds definitely worth listening to. Mm -hmm. So then shortly after that, mm -hmm. when um, I got a student job working at Plato, and uh, I was an operator, and after I graduated, I started working there as a, as a academic professional. But uh, there was uh, a young fellow who had just arrived at Plato who was also working there, and I got to know him a little bit. His name was David Fry, and huh. you recognize the name. <laughs> I recognize that name, yes. Yeah. And, and he, um, after getting to know him a few years, he decided that I was of a mind that maybe I would want to be a Baha'i. So he invited me to go to Green Lake Conference. And he knew that I was musically inclined. We actually made music together sometimes. Mm -hmm. he, he's a fine guitarist and keyboardist as well. And um, he invited me to go. And he's, to entice me, he said, Seals and Crofts will be performing there. <laughs> And although I liked their music, I wasn't entirely sure about this this thing. So I right. turned him down, but of course I wish now that I'd gone. 
Mm -hmm. But I didn't. And it wasn't until many years later that what happened was I'd become the director, sort of the, the lead programmer of the, the section that I was in. Mm -hmm. And I decided that some of these programmers that I was helping along as their sort of manager, as the lead programmer, could use some diversion. So what I did was I decided, okay, we're all going to go out to lunch together once every two weeks, and here's the bargain. I'm going to pay for the lunch, and you may talk about anything you want to except computers <laughs> or technology. Mm -hmm. It has to be about anything else is, is fair game. If you talk about computers or technology, then you pay for everybody else's lunch. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever, Michael. And this served to get their minds off of those topics, you know. Sure. Um, and it worked fairly well for six or seven months. And they soaked me for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of them ever paid. Um, but then... There was this person that I knew from high school named Amy who had come to work at the Plato Lab. She had been teaching at Uni High, and she came to work at the, which was right across the street from the lab, uh, and, um, and she asked if she could go along one time, and why not? Um, and the topic that developed was very interesting. It was about abortion. And of course, there were all kinds of opinions about it, and I had my own. But the thing that struck me is that Amy's contribution to the conversation was that in the Baha'i faith, the, the teaching is that the soul is individualized at the moment of conception. Uh -huh. The Baha'is don't take a political stance on the issue of abortion. Each individual is responsible for seeking the truth. But this was a different way of talking about the issue than I had ever heard before. People were talking about, well, when, uh, when is the baby a baby? When is it viable? When is it, yes. is it when it's born? Is it a person then, or is it after the first trimester and all this? Mm -hmm. And this had nothing to do with that. It was the soul is conceptualized at the moment of conception. The soul is individualized at the moment of conception. This made me think later. I was still thinking about this a couple of days later, and I asked her about that. Mm -hmm. And from there, <laughs> took off. She gave me something to read, and I read it, and I wanted more. And she gave me another thing to read, and another thing to read. <laughs> and then... She invited me to go to Green Lake. <laughs> <laughs> Was Seals and Crofts playing again? No, Seals and Crofts weren't there. Actually, a, a, a wonderful performer by the name of Red Grammer was there. Oh. And um, I had quite a good time listening to him. And on the way back from there, yes. because I was just a little bit too proud to declare while I was at this wonderful conference... We visited the House of Worship in Wilmette, Illinois. Oh, really? Yeah, the Baha'i House of Worship. And I declared on the grounds there. Did wow. you? Yes, I All declared right. my faith in Baha'u'llah and acknowledged the truth of everything that he says. So every time I go to visit there, I mark the spot and remember. Wow. And not to mention, eventually, Amy became... My wife. How about that? Very you found nice. a couple of good things all at once. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. that's like a win, win, win. Yeah, <laughs> sure does. Surprised our <laughs> high school uh, classmates quite a bit. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were in high school together. Uh -huh. Well, the time wasn't right at that yeah, time. It was. So, oh, that's, that's a really neat story, Michael. Mm -hmm. I'd known a little bit of it, but not... 
as much as you've talked to about this afternoon. That's great. Now, you've mentioned Red Grammar. You've mentioned uh, Seals and Croft. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, back in uh, more my generation, there was somebody I know that you were fond of his music. You're a jazz musician. And you're talking about Dizzy Gillespie. I am. Yeah, the contemporary of John Coltrane, but a wonderful jazz trumpet virtuoso, yes. One of my favorite play pieces to play on the piano is A Night in Tunisia, one of the things that he wrote. Uh-huh. And, and see, now that's, that's interesting because Gillespie and Coltrane knew each other. Uh-huh. And I think that's how those quotations on Alice Coltrane's uh, Universal Consciousness album came to be because Dizzy Gillespie, Dizzy Gillespie talked about the faith with his musician friends. Did he really? Absolutely, he did. I wonder how many people knew that he was Baha'i. One never knows. A significant number knew that they that he was a Baha'i. Really? Yes, I've read about about some of the the people. Uh, who, Miles Davis knew that he was a Baha'i. So um, you have mentioned about being in South Carolina and about and being in Taiwan. Why were you there? Well, I recognized that the the Plato Lab was in trouble, and I wanted to get away from there um, professionally. Mm -hmm. And so I accepted work in South Carolina at a corporation. I'd never worked at a corporation as a computer programmer. So um, that was why we went to South Carolina. Okay, you didn't go as a Baha'i teacher. No, but we found a, a lot of wonderful Baha'is there. I was still a relatively new Baha'i mm -hmm. at that point. Right. It was just a couple of years after I declared. Mm -hmm. So to meet a whole new set of Baha'is was invigorating and enlightening. That's great. Uh, and Taiwan? Well, that job ended uh, about a year and a half after. Mm -hmm. um, and Amy and I decided that we wanted to do something completely different. So rather than come back to Champaign, we decided to move to Taiwan. But when we got there, there was some problem involving contracts and work wasn't there. So we scrambled. And Amy found a wonderful job teaching at the island's largest private university, Donghai Dashui. And I wound up consulting in computers for the National Spiritual Assembly of Baha'is in wow. Taiwan, which was in Taipei. So I would go up there and work on their computers and try to uh, help them. <laughs> it, it was, there were a lot of viruses back then, but it wound up that what I really could do was I could program. So there was an effort to um, do something for the environment. Uh, a Baha'i from Australia, his name was Aaron Blomley, um, had uh, moved to Taiwan and was trying to, f had established a Baha'i office for the environment and was looking for some way to propagate uh, environmental issues the Baha'i way. And together we came up mostly him, but together we came up with an idea. He wanted to take little chemical kits for testing water throughout the island. He would, wanted to give it to school children and have them test the water in rivers throughout the island for purity right. and that uh -huh. sort of thing. And he needed some way to coordinate all the data that they that they got so I wrote a program mm -hmm. that would collect the data and analyze it um, on the fly uh, what would happen is the the kids could get on a modem and connect their program to our program and the data would come in and be mm. 
collected and organized, and then the report would come out. And after a while, when this started working well, the Environmental Protection Agency of the government of Taiwan became interested in this program, wow. and they nationalized it. Oh, wow. And it was a great success, and they gave us awards for this this wow. effort, and of course, in the ceremonies that went, they, we were able to talk about the Baha'i Faith. So that was my experience in Taiwan. Well, and, and just think what that must have been for those kids that were that you right. were working with. Wow. Yeah, the Environmental Protection Agency didn't have anything like that. Mm -hmm. They were able to detect some people, some corporations that were yeah. dumping toxins into the river water <laughs> and make it better. Wow. You know. Wow. That's kind of brilliant. Yeah. And <laughs> then, of course, everybody knew that Baha'is had produced this and that there was a whole philosophy behind mm -hmm. um, behind what we were doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's amazing. Ah. Well, so we're living in a pretty chaotic world, and you were talking about Baha'i perspectives. Do uh, you see any hope for civilization? Things, the world is really a mess right now. Uh, do we, as Baha'is, have anything to offer to humankind? Absolutely. <laughs> it's when I was a young boy, my father taught me, as you grow older, you'll become sure that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Don't believe it. You're just getting older and you're seeing better. So wow. as I grew, you know, I... I I noticed that this was true. I, and the more I learned, the more I was con convinced that uh, it is going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. But I didn't want to believe that. So when I was introduced to the Baha'i faith, there is a part of the, the teachings that, that deal with that. And it basically says that it is, it is up to us but there are plans for us that extend as far out as 500,000 years. <laughs> you know, God has assured us that we're going to be all right. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to be all right. Uh, because we have entered something now called the Baha'i Cycle. The first part of of our existence that we know of from religion is the Adamic cycle. And that has ended at the point where Baha'u'llah declared his mission back in 1863. The significant part of that is that the Adamic cycle is the growing up, the childhood and adolescence of the people of the world, the human species, and now we have entered our maturity. So there was so much turmoil before then, but now we have a new cycle, which is to last 500,000 years, the Baha'i cycle, and in it we are, we are given assurance that that cycle will be fulfilled and there will be more prophets along the way yeah. to, to guide us into this glorious future a golden age is to come yeah that now that we're adults we've achieved the maturity as a species to carry this into fruition right because um baha'is believe that when muhammad called himself the seal of the prophets we believe that what he was the seal of is the seal of the adamic cycle right that was the age of prophecy now we're in the age of fulfillment Yes. So um, it's so it complex. Isn't it does. It? It, and there's so much to know <laughs> about this, and of course, mm -hmm. there's so much new that's come up, uh, into world religion by the writings of Baha'u'llah. Right. Okay. Let's uh, go on to something a little different for a moment. Right now, we are halfway through 
a 19-day period of fasting. Right. We have one more week to go, and after that will be Nauru's. So I think we probably have some explaining to do. Yeah. Uh, last month, we told our listeners about Ayamiha, the four- to five-day period of uh, the end of the Baha'i year where we have these few spare intercalary days and we kind of party and give gifts and just and have this little festive. Yep. So let's talk about the fast, uh, how we do it, why we do it. Uh, Michael, would you tell us a little bit about what you see as the purpose of fasting, what some of your experiences have been? This is my 25th fast and... I've grown quite accustomed to it. I like it. It's one of the most special times of the year for me. It's, there are two kinds of fasts. There's a physical fast, which people sometimes do for health reasons or to lose weight or something like that. And then there's a spiritual fast, and that's what we're talking about with the Baha'i fast. And that's the part that I really like about it because as time goes along not eating food or drinking anything in the daylight hours time starts to slow down for me and I notice that I start paying more attention to the things that I'm doing throughout the day mm -hmm. and it reminds me of the the Zen Buddhist concept of mindfulness. Mm. I try to be mindful during the rest of the year, but during the fast, my spiritual awareness is enhanced and my mindfulness is enhanced. And I examine the things that I'm doing throughout this 19 day period with a, a special attentiveness and, and focus and I can see where I'm doing things well or mm -hmm. not so well, and I can make adjustments, and it has this quality of, of the right thing to do. So I'm really improving myself considerably during the fast, and I thank Baha'u'llah for bringing this about. So it's for you, it's not a, a chore. It's a real blessing. It was a chore the first couple of years because mm -hmm. I spent so much time focusing on the physical part of it. Mm -hmm. But I soon recognized the spiritual value of the process. Well, thank you for your input about the fast. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, I have just marveled as I have observed Baha'is and, and it, it sounds so difficult, and yet when I hear people like you say that you look forward to it, it's a joy, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Michael, we are so glad that you have been with us today. It's, it's been a real delight, enjoyed your music, and so that is really great. Okay, other uh, upcoming events at the Baha'i Center in Urbana over the next month will be on each Sunday morning, devotions at 10.30. On March 22nd, this will be followed by potluck dinner and game day, a time just to enjoy each other's company for all ages, groups, and guests. Uh, Nauru's will be celebrated on March 21st. Michael, would you mind closing the program for us today with a prayer? One of the other things that I like to think about during the fast is that at the same time that I'm fasting, there are about seven million other Baha'is all over the world fasting. I like to think of this as unity. So I'm going to say a prayer for unity. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, oh my God, verily I invoke thee and supplicate before thy threshold, asking thee that all thy mercies may descend upon these souls. Specialize them for thy favor and thy truth. O Lord, unite and bind together the hearts. 
Join in accord all the souls and exhilarate the spirits through the signs of thy sanctity and oneness. O Lord, make these faces radiant through the light of thy oneness. Strengthen the loins of thy servants in the service of thy kingdom. O Lord, thou possessor of infinite mercy, O Lord, of forgiveness and pardon, forgive our sins, pardon our shortcomings, and cause us to turn to the kingdom of thy clemency, invoking the kingdom of might and power, humble at thy shrine and submissive before the glory of thine evidences. O Lord God, make us as waves of the sea, as flowers of the garden, united, agreed through the bounties of thy love. O Lord, dilate the breasts through the signs of thy oneness, and make all mankind as stars shining from the same height of glory, as perfect fruits growing upon thy tree of life. Verily thou art the Almighty, the self-subsistent, the giver, the forgiving, the pardoner, the omniscient, the one creator. CD music in today's program are The Prisoner, sung by Dan Seals, and Baha'u'llah by Grant Hinden Miller. If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i community in Champaign, Urbana, or any of the activities we've mentioned today, you can visit our website at www.cu-bahai.org. If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i Faith, please visit www.bahai.us. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next month. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this week's Weekend Heartbeat on WEFT Champaign 90.1 FM, Community Radio, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org.